Okay, hello. Uh, I thought I would make a video because um, at Code Sandbox we are constantly like reiterating on state management in the um, in the client, and we are exploring some new stuff at the moment. And I wanted to show it off. And I'm going to use an example of a really really complex flow, which is our um, sign-in flow during development. Um, well, our sign-in flow in general is very complicated. Um, but the, we are specifically going to look at uh, during development. Uh, so at first I'm going to uh, show you quickly the existing logic, and then I'm going to show you uh, what we're doing uh, to improve this stuff. So this is an action called uh, sign in button clicked. Uh, and I have to point out that there's a long history of this logic. So uh, some of it is like, we're, it's a startup and we have to move fast and you know how it is. Uh, and things change all the time. So it's, this code is heavily affected by lots of changes over time and also changing out uh, the approach of, of managing it. Anyways, so we had this sign in button clicked. And what's interesting to us is that we are moving to an internal action, which we call sign in. Uh, during sign-in, uh, we are uh, trying to authenticate um, using a provider, which will be GitHub or, or Google in, in, this, um, uh, in this context. And as you can see, we do have things like uh, sign-in model open. We have like lots of single states. Uh, pending user is suddenly set to null here. We're now grabbing the user asynchronously also the running the provider was async we're doing something more async here changing some more state and uh, what i really want to point out here is how to uh, deal with asynchronous code because what we don't really think about often as developers is that when we write this kind of asynchronous code it looks synchronous right every line seems to execute right after the other but at, at least we have a very good indicator when that is not the case. It's the await keyword. But what we don't often think about as developers is that every time this await keyword occurs, we might be completely out of context on the next line. This code might not be valid at all, or executing this code might not be valid because the user did some kind of interaction that made this execution invalid. And that's uh, the main source of, uh, of bugs and especially difficult bugs. Because when we test this piece of logic uh, in development, this almost moves synchronously. Like running all these asynchronous requests happens insanely fast and you are testing this specific flow. So you are not clicking around, messing up stuff. Uh, so it, it's always like the happy path. Now, um, so we are not really dealing with this. And this is like typical code. In my experience, this is how you typically do things. Um, but it's not really that good. <laughs> but let's uh, dive into like run provider auth. So in this case, we're seeing that we are suddenly pointing directly to process. Uh, we are uh, creating some URLs there. We are... Um, setting uh, some scope based on the provider. And then we're opening a pop-up um, with that authentication path. And then we have this thing where we are waiting for a specific uh, message. On uh, And this is uh, an abstraction we use. It's called effects. And it's basically uh, our own custom API for different things happening externally. So in this case, on the browser, we are waiting for the message sign in. And if that happens, um, we uh, are checking if we're in development authentication, which is the logic we are going to look at. Uh, and in that case, we are like uh, setting some local storage. We suddenly have a, some logic here to, to create a cookie, which also just happens in line. Um, but the interesting thing here is that when we're waiting for this message, we're also waiting for other messages. And we kind of do expect one of these messages to occur, 
We don't expect multiple of them, but the logic here doesn't care about that. And again, this is history. These messages were added later, right? But uh, my point here is to, is to show you that um, we are not dealing with the asynchronicity here because the user might close the pop-up during um, uh, when we are waiting for this message. And this message might appear later at some point, right? Um, so uh, then it's suddenly not valid anymore because user has maybe navigated away or whatever. It doesn't matter. So um, how would we more effectively actually deal with this flow? Um, so we are going to take a look at that now. So part of this new solution, and this is being built specifically for code sandbox um, and we're still experimenting with it but if we're going to use it it will probably open be open sourced um, later but it's based on a different concept uh, it's not based on like a single state tree where you have decoupled the state from the logic it's rather based on classes um, and dependency injection. But the dependency injection is part of the actual state management tool, which allows us to do things like this. So what you see here are different features. And this overview is the code. This is not something that's been built uh, visually and stored in some metadata format. This is the actual code. Um, and the features we have added here is like navigator, which can move to like home uh, and so on and so on. And uh, you see, we have like factories here. So for example, the navigator we, is only a singleton. There's a single instance of that, but an editor, uh, we can have recreate the editor. So it's a factory and we can see what depends it the dependencies it has to other things. We can see what state it has. In this case, a context. Uh, if we move to the sandbox, we can see the ones that are highlighted are observable. So when we look at these properties in a component, the component will uh, reconcile if any of them changes um, and so on. But the thing, um, and what's interesting is when we actually run the application, this static overview will start populate itself with runtime data. So you can actually see the, the values of these different properties uh, and you can see execution of the different methods and stuff. Anyways, um, so that's more conceptually what this is. What we're going to look at is this auth feature. And this auth feature is a state machine. So you can give these features different uh, capabilities and state machine is one of them. So let's open that file and take a look at how we actually do the sign in here. Okay, so to uh, explain how we do this differently in, in this tool, um, we are, and we are doing it quite differently. Um, we are not, um, we are still exposing uh, a single method to do a sign in. So like when the user clicks something, our logic calls this method. But instead of starting to run the logic, we are just, uh, sending an event into the machine. And this is the whole concept, right? Because when the user clicks sign in, they might click it multiple times or they might move around and change the context of the application where this logic we uh, previously looked at it starts becoming invalid. But in this case, we're just sending an event, uh, which means that we can actually deal with that event. Is this something we should be doing now? Uh, and to understand how that event works, let's go up to the definition of the actual uh, machine. And in this concept, uh, you define a machine by giving it the different contexts it can be in, where each context is labeled by a specific state. So uh, we can be in a, an authenticating context, an authenticated context, a duplicate context, signing up, signing in, an authenticated, an authenticating. And the reason I call it context is because the state might have related values. So in this case, the authenticated state has a related current user value. Uh, and that uh, becomes the context. That's how I think about it. 
And then we have all the different events that can occur and that points to the asynchronous uh, nature of this feature. Because there's tons of different events, which means there's tons of different asynchronous stuff happening. So uh, initially we have like sign in requested and sign out requested. That's like from the public methods, like what the, what's being called when the, the user interacts with those two um, things. Uh, but then we have, we might receive uh, a duplicate account message, a sign up message, a sign in message. We need to grab the user, which might resolve or uh, an error might uh, appear. You might abort the, the sign in uh, because it's like a pop up thing and you might just close it. Uh, you might be signed out where that might, there might be an error related to that. Uh, and then when you're signing out, that's actually a call to the API, which might resolve or might reject. So there are tons of things happening here. Um, and being able to, and this is not something we would easily identify, um, with the previous code. We were just doing everything in line and understanding these different states and uh, the different events that actually happen there implicitly, it's very difficult to identify. But uh, defining it like this, you, you, uh, you more clearly see uh, how the flow moves and what can happen in the different flows. Anyways, so the way you actually deal with this is that whenever an event is sent into the machine, this method runs on event. And what we do is that we transition the current context looking at this new event, which means that when we are in the unauthenticated uh, state, the only event we will actually deal with is the sign in requested event. If any other event is triggered related to, um, uh, yeah, if any other event is triggered, they won't be handled because we say that in an unauthenticated state, we are only going to deal with sign in requested, which means if the user clicks like crazy um, on sign in, which triggers this event, as soon as this is triggered, we are returning the new authenticating state, which means that those won't be handled at all. But related to uh, the sign in requested, we are not only returning uh, a new authenticating state, we are actually starting some logic to run. And in this logic, we are again opening the pop-up, but we are rather, uh, we have cleaned this up quite a bit because we have a singleton called environment where we actually have our authentication endpoint. Um, and what we try to do is um, either we wait for the pop-up to close, that might happen before we get any messages, or we wait for one of these specific messages. Whichever ones of these happen first, either closing the pop-up or uh, any of these messages rece is received, will become the result here. Which means that if we don't have a result, we are just saying, oh, the pop-up was closed, I'm going to send sign in abort. Now, the thing is, the user might have moved this pop-up and started changing the context of the page again, which means that if we were to inline this logic, we could have produced an invalid state. But since we're sending this event sign in abort, and for some reason, the, the state of this auth had changed, nothing would happen when we sent this event. Like it would just uh, seamlessly fail, kind of. Um, but if we do have a message, we check the type and then we send different events based on what actually happened. And then uh, we close the, uh, the pop-up. Um, yes, so we are authenticating and now we can uh, receive these different events and they're only received if we're actually authenticating. And then uh, as we can see, we are um, when these events occur, we are basically just moving straight into some new states. But uh, if we actually get the sign in, then we're going to set that token and we're going to start getting the current user, which we do uh, moving into a new state called signing in. And again, current user, we're trying to grab the current user. We're sending if it's resolved or rejected which can only be dealt with during signing in. 
and so on and so on. I don't have to go through everything. Um, you might wonder like, why don't we use like X state for this? Well, the thing is we need to use, uh, we're using MobX under the hood here uh, because we need observable state uh, in terms of performance. Uh, for us, it's been a bad experience using immutable approaches uh, for the whole UI. Uh, it's really hard to optimize the UI with that. Um, so by using MobX, we uh, we get performance out of the box because the components only uh, reconcile when the state they point to actually uh, change. Another thing is that we find it better for developers to just use um, plain uh, imperative logic um, in the complex with the complexity that we do at Code Sandbox it's more approachable in our experience. It's not that a uh, functional immutable uh, approach is wrong. It's just harder to deal with. And especially uh, writing all the, comp we're not transforming data. You know, we're doing a ton of different uh, state changes. We're running side effects. And yeah, it's just two different ways of doing it. And for example, VS Code, they have a straightforward uh, class-based or object-oriented approach and uh, Code Sandbox is has a lot of shared complexity with VS Code so uh, it's certainly a valid way to to approach things but yeah there are different opinions on that but that's the way it works here if you wonder about that but yeah I, I hope this concept kind of shows you uh, like the point here was to explain, like give a really good example of how state machines actually improves um, your logic. And it the example also points out the stuff we're actually not dealing with in our code. Um, yeah, and I wanted to kind of briefly uh, show you the, the tool we're working on and um, we'll share more if our experimentation is, is successful. But yeah, um, that's basically it. I hope you found it interesting. Um, and yeah, bye.